find your seats. Take that last picture. And also, if I were you, I'm get a piece of paper and pen because you can take it on notes. So please come on in. People from outside, make your way in. And also, if you use your telephone when you're on break, would you please make sure that you turn it on? Cell phones, turn them on. Okay. Well, we got them. Please, if we can sit down, we can find a seat. I see some open spots, not that many, so you better hurry up. Come on in. Okay. Okay, we still have people walking in. We need to find your seats. Turn up your cell phones. Get ready to learn. Pay attention to the guy up here. I want everybody to pay attention. This is the boy. I used to think that because I was short, a lot of people didn't listen to me. But after seeing that amazing presentation by Patricia Frick, size doesn't matter. Please, if you can find a seat back there, if you can please sit down, we're ready to start. If you are not here this morning to hear uh, Patricia Frick's keynote, well, you missed out. You missed out on a fantastic presentation and also some fabulous dancing. <laughs> However, this fast-moving, highly interactive session is full on mini coaching and design to help you see Fripp's principles in action. In her over 30-year career, Patricia's audience has been as varied as nuns and prison wardens, rocket scientists and nuclear engineers, IRS agents and community doctors, biotech executives and project managers, pharmaceutical scientists and builders, firefighters and image consultants. Her speech coaching clients include Fortune 500 executives, uh, celebrity and high fee professional speakers, sales teams, who sell a very high ticket offering. Please welcome back the speaker, speaker, and the man, speech coach, Patricia Priv. I just wanted a help from cute young man. <laughs> Will you raise your hand if you are not with us this morning? All right, good. Well, welcome to part two, which is designed to be very interactive. And this morning, the points were, if you want to prepare and present a powerful presentation, that you need to start strong. You need stories that emotionally connect to your audience. You need strong you-focused language, so again, you can connect to your audience. You need a simple structure, and you need razor-sharp specificity. This afternoon will be mostly interactive. We will ask people to come up and we'll work on their openings of their presentations. Now, I warn you, do not think you're going to come up and deliver eight minutes. <laughs> I would rather have 
more people come up for just a couple of sentences, or the point is, until there is a suggestion that can be valuable. Now, as you are looking at your friends up here in the hot seat, look at the principles that we are working on that takes a good presentation and make it great. And then, start considering how you might use this in your own life. Now the first 30 seconds and the last 30 seconds has the most impact. If there is nothing else in your presentation, always script the opening. Not that you're going to read it, but you need to see in black and white, clear, concise, take out every word that isn't needed. As Jerry Seinfeld said, I will invest an hour taking an eight-word sentence and edit it to five. In his case, it will be funnier. In our case, it will be more memorable. Because our goal should always be to speak, to be remembered and repeated. Now, this morning, I gave you an example of my Larry Mariottini story, which is a story that you can start a presentation with. Now, there are many ways to open a presentation, and one good one is an interesting statistic or little-known fact. This works especially well if the statistic or little-known fact is from the audience's world and not yours. For example, four years ago, I was invited to address 350 Seventh-day Adventist pastors. Who was impressed? Oh, really good. <laughs> Would it impress you less if I told you the day before there were 500? It's just this was the fourth day of a conference, and you know three days is long enough. Now what we always have to consider is what is the audience thinking as they walk into the room? So this was a four-hour session on how to design and deliver a more charismatic sermon. And I would expect even a generous and gracious audience would be looking at the program thinking, hmm, she's the only person on a four-day program who isn't a minister. <laughs> how can anyone who isn't a minister tell me how to write a better sermon than I write one every day? I bet she isn't even a Seventh Day Adventist. <laughs> Which of course I'm not. However, this is how I start. Four hundred and sixty-five times in the Bible, it said it came to pass. It did not say it came to stay. <laughs> and unless your sermon is well constructed, artfully crafted, and charismatically delivered, it will not come to stay in the hearts, minds, and lives of your congregation. They, of course, have plenty of amens, hallelujahs, and feel free any time you hear something you like. If amen is the right approach, give it. <laughs> Can you also realize that I did not think of that opening when my foot hit the steps to walk on stage? I knew how I was going to open. If you work from an outline because you know your content, and of course most of my coaching is with corporate executives and, and high price sales teams, and people who, once they get started, they're experts at this subject matter. They aren't bad. Very few know how to start strong and conclude on a high. That is why 
we will start by inviting some specific people to come up and just deliver the opening of the presentation. So I will ask, who is the audience? What is the speech subject or title? We will then, I will mention their name, you will give them one clap, so it's a nice clean start, and they will speak until I touch them. And that means I have some advice. I would like to first, and those of you who were not here this morning, might not realize there are ways that you can take me home. <laughs> and it does, of course, require a credit card <laughs> or cash or a check. Now, some wise people decided I want to take it all. And so these are the individuals, if they wish to, I will invite first. So I believe I have a couple. Come on down. Come on down. Now, as you can see, this is Deborah, and she is a DTM, and she works with Chronic Foods North Shore. All right. Do you have members of your Toastmaster Club here? No. <gasps> you are going to go back. Look, we're going to record this and you're going to tell the members of your club I shared main stage with Patricia Fred and you weren't there to see me. <laughs> All right, Deborah. Now what I'm going to do, oh, I have two mics. You know, what am I doing? I took the wrong mic, didn't I? Or I didn't come back. Where's the other? Oh, here it is. Oh. Now, which is the best one, this one or this one? <laughs> round and round the rugged rock, the ragged rascal round. I am going to keep this one. <laughs> All right, Deborah. And, and the gentlemen are telling me, don't hold it too close to your mouth. Around here is fine. All right. What is the title or subject of this presentation that we get a sample of the opening? Courage to change. Perfect. And do you have a specific audience in mind? I gave the speech to a Toastmasters conference. But when they pay you big bucks, who is going to be the perfect? Is there a perfect audience? Men, women, business professionals, entrepreneurs, anyone? I would want to give this speech to Probably more women. Okay, perfect. All right, so stand over there, and then when I say Deborah, they will give you one clap, and as you walk on stage, here's a technique. Always start with your right foot, which is the upstage foot, so your body turns slightly towards the audience. Make eye contact as you're walking up, and then stand still. Do not distract from the magic of your words with unnecessary movement. How you stand represents the stability of your ideas, the stability of the company you represent. Now that doesn't mean you're not going to move. However, in at least 99% of the time, I would recommend you walk up and you plant your feet. Then just deliver, and when I touch your back, stop. Here's Deborah. Have you ever wanted to change, but didn't know where to... <laughs> now, this is the same advice I gave Craig Valentine. Now, what you said was, Have you ever... Stop there. I would recommend you say, how often have you? Because this means it's more than once. Which means whatever advice you're going to give is more valuable than if it was one problem or one thought you had one time never ever to be considered. Can you see it's now making the message more important? 
Now, will you raise your hand if you, did you say ever wanted to change, had to change? Wanted. Wanted. Will you raise your hand if you've ever wanted to change? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> you have actually wanted to change. <laughs> you are perverts. <laughs> Can I see my friends who probably stay nice and comfortable? <laughs> yeah, we like the comfort. We like the comfort. So what is the second one? So how often have you wanted to change? Do you think the audience would be thinking frequently or not at all? I would I was supposing frequently. <laughs> but apparently not at all. <laughs> now again, these are theatrical choices. What you are now seeing is the creative process. And the creative process is messy. This is why you join Toastmasters. This is why you join NSA. This is why you have a mastermind group. Because you go back and forth and find out what works. So perhaps you might want to change it to say, how, how often have you been in a situation where you were expected to change? So first of all, then everyone is going to say yes, because we've all been in certain in situations. Did you embrace it? I wonder if you could get out <laughs> Now again, everyone's going to go with these two categories. Now what is the advice that you're going to give them about change? I joined a 12-step group, okay. which gave me the process of how to change and the support of the people in that group. Okay, perfect. Then perhaps you might suggest you are probably familiar with the 12-step process. And what works about a process is you have support, encouragement, you have a formula to follow. So what I would recommend, or I think you are probably doing, you see, what are you now expecting from the speech? That you were going to give us at least what works in a 12-step process that would now work for whatever situation you're in that will help you embrace change more positively. Is that helpful? Correct. Yes. Thank you. Oh, my good. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. Now, as you are listening to our friends in the hot seat, take the lessons and how it will apply to you. All right. Come on. You bought a big packet. So, how do I pronounce your name? Mommy. Okay, so he is retiring, or she is retiring, is it man or woman? A man. A man. And how long has he worked at the company? 11 years. 11 years. And did you work with him closely? Yes. All right. The boss. All right, good. And how long are your remarks? Two, three minutes. Two, three minutes. To, to, and you say you're going to thank him. What are you going to thank him for? For changing my life. Doing a lot of things that change my life. All right, good. So we will give you one clap, and then so you are going to start center stage. <laughs> so one clap, and then give us your first few lines. Here's the moment. And imagine yourself sitting in the cubicle looking at planes. Then came Bob Walsh to the rescue. He told us, go out to conduct investigations 
and he took your witnesses. Woo! Okay. Me? Good. <laughs> going to suggest is that we put this into context. And his name is Bob? Bob Loss. And your company is... What is your Oh, I've worked for them many times, time to invite me back. <laughs> <laughs> How about this? And I'm going to have you repeat after me. Blue Cross Blue Shield has said goodbye and thank you to many leaders. Just say. Blue Cross Blue Shield has said goodbye to many leaders. However, none who will be missed more than Bob Walsh. However, none will be missed more than Bob Walsh. I will never forget. I will never forget. Eleven years ago. Eleven years ago. When now, eleven years ago, how would you describe yourself uh, as far as your job? Were you shy, apprehensive, nervous? Yes. <laughs> I will never forget 11 years ago, as a shy, nervous, young claims adjuster. Yes, claim reviewer. I was an investigator. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, even more important, so I want you to say that. I will never forget 11 years ago, when I was a very shy, timid investigator. Terrified to go out and talk to anybody, let it go any, let it alone anyone where there might be some conflict. Terrified. <laughs> I was terrified to go out to speak to anyone that might be in contact. <laughs> Until came along came the best boss you can ever find. <laughs> His simple advice to His simple advice to me <laughs> all of us. His simple advice for all of you, all of us. <laughs> to go out to interview witnesses and start conducting investigations. Well, if you were nervous before, what would, but he, it was, you see, you were nervous before, but it was your job that you didn't like doing. So he must have said something that gave you the courage to go out and do it. So perhaps he said is, this is an adventure. Go out and investigate and talk to people. Or, what? He must have said something. So can you can you see what we're doing? So I'm recommending that you calm down. This is not a Toastmaster adventure. This is, and probably you'll be behind a lectern because it's a formal evening. So I want you to work on the power of the words and certainly script it out and take notes. Just make sure they're 22 point type. You can look down and see. Rehearse it so it becomes second nature. But you've got the other. 
because you're not just saying goodbye to him, you're saying goodbye to the best boss Blue Cross Blue Shield has ever had. And now, see, whenever you make a claim like that, he's the best boss, you have to give a specific example, which we are. He is the hero of the story. And then we can close by saying, on behalf of anybody who has ever had the privilege of working with you, thank you. You will never be forgotten. And we make the commitment to take your words and influence to everyone we ever work with. Wow. Yeah. Do you see the power yeah. of knowing who the audience is, what you want to get across before you start crafting your words? Now, did anybody else buy a big pack? A big pack. Now, look, first of all, it's the big pack. The big pack, women and men. Come on down. So far, it's the women that want to take me home. Now you took your name tag off, so who's Barbara? All right, Barbara, and we're going to hear the opening of what presentation? Yes. Okay, and are you a survivor? All right, good, and perfect, perfect. And then you have Michelle? But I didn't speak at 7 o'clock this morning. I get right I get right there. And for the person who said, oh, seeing your age, obviously did the calculation, gives me up. <laughs> but one does get right there. All right. All right. So Barbara is going to talk. She has had a, a, an incredible experience, and she is now inspiring women who have ovarian cancer. Okay, good. Here's Barbara. Two out of three women in the world discover they have ovary cancer. Out of those three women, I was one of the two that discovered in 2001 that I had cancer, ovary cancer. This was the most scary and also educational information I found out from my doctor. All right, good, good. Now, now, this is good. This is very good. And, of course, it is a dramatic statistic, especially when you find out she's one of the statistics. Right. I'm suggesting your opening line is, let me think for a second. Statistics are interesting. Once you find out, you become one of those statistics. Okay, now, well, Mr. Jelly, statistics are interesting until you become one of them and they are scary. Right? Okay, so let's do it line for time. Statistics are interesting until you become one of them, and they are scary. When you are talking about ovarian cancer, 
the statistics are two out of three women in America. In 2010, always do time is a setup. In 2010, I discovered I was one of the statistics. In 2010, I found out I was one of those statistics. Good news. As you can see, I'm happy, healthy, and you are about to find out how. All right. All right. Give her a hand. wonderful information. Now we all know a lot more information than we ever use. The question, and some of you said, is your brother the guitarist Robert Fripp? Yes. Woo! Robert Fripp is, is given credit for starting the progressive rock movement. He had a group King Crimson. In fact, with me I have a t-shirt their last performance with Robert was 2008 here in Chicago. I have a t-shirt in my room. No, you can't come see it. <laughs> Perhaps if you see me in the gym later. But as, as Robert would say, you might know a technique, but can you take it to the stage? See, it's one thing to analytically understand it. For example, one of the really great speech coaches I worked with, Ron Arden, came from a theatrical background. And he said to me, Frick, you're doing a really great job at adding variety within your presentation. Now, see if you can put variety into every single sentence. Now, I understood the principle. It took four years to understand how to do it. I realized I should have asked him, can you give me a specific example? <laughs> now here's some advanced techniques. Not every word is of equal importance. And I have a friend who's an acting coach who said, Patricia, words are $10 each. And you got $30 for the sentence. They would say, well, Patricia, most sentences have more than three words. Well, of course, that means not everyone is of equal importance. So you look at, once you have your script, you might look at it and underline the words that are the most important. And this is how actors interpret and very often change your performance from one to the other. Now let's look at a quote that I like, perhaps you do, from General Eisenhower. General Eisenhower said, leadership is the ability to decide what has to be done and get people to want to do it. Now, I am exaggerating the words that I perceive as the most important ones in the sentence. Now, you might choose other words, but you, you look at this as, what are the words you're going to punch? Now, you wouldn't do it as loud as I did. I'm just helping you understand the concept. But you punch the words that are more important. Now, let's look at another advanced concept. Because even if you are a beginner or a novice speaker, you might as well learn advanced concepts at the beginning. One of my friends is a genius copywriter called David Garvey. And he gave me a book called The Brilliance Breakthrough. 
You don't have to read. Believe me. <laughs> no, because the premise of the book is all you need. He said, this is the best copywriting book I've ever read. And the author's premise, the central thing, the big idea, remember every speech, every article, every TV show, every book, every movie has a premise or a central thing. The author said, forget nouns, adjectives, adverbs, pronouns. There are only two types of words. Picture words and connecting words. Because our audience, remember our audience remembers what they see when they hear our words. This is why stories that paint a scene are so vivid. But we can do this with individual sentences. Because our choice of words paints a different picture. So let's take a simple sentence. I walked into the boss's office. I sauntered into the boss's office. I raced into the boss's office. So you see, each one has a different picture, and the word choice you're going to deliver raced differently than sauntered. But this is how you add flavor and color to your presentations. Now let's just imagine. Sir, your name is? Brent. 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 Now Brent, are you a married gentleman? No. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't tell me there's so many single guys here. All right, now, if we said, let's just imagine, Brent went on a date and took flowers. Now, we're all going to see that scene differently. Flowers, we don't know what they look like, we're going to make up, we'll probably think about the last flowers we gave our favorite flowers. Now, if you said, Brent, Brent, went on a date and took her daisies. Now you know this is probably a first date or early in the relationship and he's just making a nice gesture. Now if we said Brent went on a date and took two dozen red roses, we know he's probably getting ready to pop the question. <laughs> Either that or he had a really good time last night. <laughs> Now, can, can you see the difference? You see the importance of choosing words well. Now, let's look at the movement that goes with the words. Let's go back to the last sentence. The before the flowers. I don't want to focus on your love life much longer. <laughs> Until perhaps you mix and mingle later. That's up to you. They not go, you're single. You have got your $50 worth. <laughs> if you said whatever words you chose, I walked into the boss's office and I said, boss, I need a raise because I've been working really hard. Now, I would expect you would see that scene, walk in the boss's office, stand in front of the desk and talk to the boss. Now, if you keep walking, while you are telling that story, I would imagine you walk in the boss's office, you walk over his desk, push the chair down, walk across his face and out the window. <laughs> See, your movement has to match your words. So with that, I did have other women and gentlemen who brought a whole pack of Freddy. Do any of you want to come up? <laughs> All right, fine. Well, the next person I would invite up would be some, uh, a, a slightly more experienced speaker 
someone who's been in Tosinos for a while, that if I ask you to repeat what you said, as our, our people already have, I need you to be able to say it again. So, beginning the area of whatever presentation, but if I say stop, do it again, you can actually do that. All right, volunteer. Okay, come on down, this noise is. You're going to be... <laughs> Anybody is too big a question. It's too big an audience. Now, you do realize that although there are universal messages that would apply to everyone, you cannot focus on the audience unless you can picture them. Especially when you get to the press. You know, every entrepreneur can. Every Toastmaster can. Every leader can. But for now, we're going to say this is a Toastmaster conference. And remember, you've got main stage with Fred, the outside guest speaker. This is a big deal. Yes, what is your message about? And now you can hold your mic about here. What is your message about on the speech title? Always wear clean underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Because if you work on the principle, nobody gives a damn about anybody else except themselves, you will never go wrong. <laughs> now, as you can tell, I speak in black and white to get your attention. Obviously, you have relationships, but you really are here to learn ideas for you. Now, if anyone else gets ideas, that's fine, but you're really here for you. So I would ask, so your line was, how many of you? I would say, how often have you, or how often do you, or something that is focused on you and everyone hears, Lashonda is talking right to me. All right, so stand there. One clap. Lashonda. How often have you heard the saying, always wear clean underwear? in case you get into an accident and have to go to the hospital. Good. Now, I'm going to suggest you change that and say, how often has your mother told you? Because now you're introducing another character that can come back and she can have more advice and be more developed through the speech and can in fact be the featured one. But raise your hand if anyone ever gave you that advice that was not your mother. <laughs> <laughs> now of course there will be there will be some people, but talking to the majority, you see, so I would go, and that's how you do your research. It's that simple. You ask a target audience. So your opening line will now be, do not give her another clap, just so now you have two changes to make. How often have you heard your mother tell you, always wear clean underwear, un un <laughs> in case you get into an accident? All right, now that's good. And I'm just going to, because once you've got the words, you've got to have to deliver. 
so say, how often, and I would actually change rather than say to tell you, how often have you heard your mother tell you, now you're going to deliver in, you did it in dialogue, but more obvious dialogue. Don't forget to wear clean underwear just in case you get in an accident. <laughs> and that was your mum saying. <laughs> She's your mother, so I know this is a character. <laughs> How often have you heard your mother say, You better wear some underwear, girl, in case you get into an accident. <laughs> speech mother comes back. Now in a longer speech, what you could do, you could use that as a transition line to your next talking point. That's very good. All right. <coughs> Let who came the longest distance to be me? If you how many miles? Anyone farther than Madison, Wisconsin? Fine if you want to have one hand. 
You see, people will say, why do you use a handheld mic? Well, one, not many people know what to do with two hands. <laughs> you know, I've seen, I've seen people, literally, and you know, they'd be gesticulating with one hand and the other's down at the side, and then they check. You know, first of all, you think, oh, poor man, he was injured in the war. <laughs> really from the waistband up. You want to bring a t a attention to your face. Now, if you don't know what to do with your hands, that's fine. If you've got a PowerPoint, you can hold the clicker. You can put your hands at the end of a table if you're giving a presentation in your boardroom. Now, you see, you're, I haven't forgotten you. You see, I haven't forgotten you. You're doing a lot of stage time, and you're doing very well. You stand on stage. <laughs> You can put your hands here, just don't grasp it like you're nervous. All right, now back to you. <laughs> this is to a group to inspire them. Um, to do what? Works. Okay, to inspire them to do what? It's to inspire them to learn from animals and to adopt. Oh, good. All right, perfect. Nice message. Nice message. All right. Oh, very clever, you wrote it both sides, very clever. Because next year you should actually have name tag, because they can be swiggly with you. Yeah, very clever. All right. So, to inspire us to do something with animals and not eat them. <laughs> All right. One clap. Here's Scott. Imagine spending over 23 hours a day alone. Some of you might want that. Some of you might want to put someone now, in love. Okay, okay, good. Now, what I love, Scott, is your energy and your passion and your inspires. And I'm going to give you the same advice that, that some my good speech coach, Ron Martin, gave me at the beginning. And that is, I want you to start at 80% Scott. Don't come out at 80% Scott the same as I'm not coming out at the beginning. 100% free. Because you have to have someone to build to and come down. You need to orchestrate. Especially when you get more passionate later about, this, about the subject. We want you to build to a crescendo. So don't come here that isn't you, but just calm down. So I want you to breathe. And then, after the first line, you were talking about how many of us? Remember, it's one person. All right, so just calm down, and then after you deliver your opening line, because that is a dramatic opening line, pause and let the audience think about it. It might be counterintuitive, but you actually bring your audience closer to you on the pause and the silence, because that is when they, they think about it and internalize what they just heard. Okay. Here's Scott. Imagine you spend 23 hours a day alone. All right, good. Now, I can, now, it's not a matter of right or wrong. It's a matter of theatrical choices. What works best? You just test it. So imagine, imagine spending, spending, imagine spending 23 hours hours alone every day for however long it's going to be. Because you see, it's one thing to be alone for 23 hours. It's one thing to be alone for 23 hours for weeks on end, or months on end. Here's Scott. Imagine you spend 23 hours a day alone. 
I'm going to say that alone every day. Because you see, it's alone then every day for however long it is. You spend 23 hours alone every day for several months. Well, I like to say pick one. Three months. Just, just pick one and make it more specific. So let's just say you pick three months. What's the next one? Imagine, even though you're alone, someone is right here in the neighboring space. Okay, now was your first word of your first sentence imagine? Yeah. Then you're not going to use it in the second. Because you see, if you're imagining, you're putting us in a scene. We're in the scene. You don't have to take us back there. By using the same word again, you're taking us out of the scene. Because we're there. We're beginning to imagine. All right, so how do you make this? What you're trying to say is you're trying to picture that rock. So first of all, we see we're alone for months. And then suddenly we have a companion. Is that what you're yeah. right. yeah. All right. Well, yeah. What you're trying to say, that then into our loneliness comes a companion or a partner. All right, well, just say what you're going to say, but don't do it with a man. But it gets worse. This is your space. This is your neighbor's space. Uh -huh. Okay, good. So it's not us, it's the little doggy. Okay, very good. Now, what I would say is, it's worse. Or it get, uh, well, what did you say your words were? But it gets worse. I would say take the back. It gets worse. It gets worse. Your entire existence or your entire home is, I would say, two foots. Give me a specific. Because, see, remember, if you're listening on CD, even if you moved to see it, get in the habit of telling the audience what they see. Because often people listen to it and they're not there. Imagine spending 23 hours a day alone every day for three months. It gets worse. Your space is three feet by six feet. And right next door, someone else's space, three feet by six feet. Good. What I would say is your neighbor, because it isn't somewhere else. You're doing a very good job at letting us think it's, it's a person. So I don't want you to say someone, I want you to say your neighbor. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, you got something to work with? All right, give them a hand. Would you agree if they came this fast, they deserve it? Yes. Yeah. All right, so let's see. We are Nancy from Whitby City Professional Speakers.
just, do you remember once? And then the next sentence is the fear and excitement. Because again, we're there. All right? Take two. Here's Nancy. Do you remember your first roller coaster ride? The fear and the excitement? Now, what I want you to sew down, and I want you to do $10 words. So I want you to, and for how do you get it in your body? You will never do anything in front of an audience that makes you feel like an idiot. However, that's why you go to Toastmasters, because you exaggerate in rehearsal to get it into your body, the muscle memory. So I want you to almost exaggerate just to get in the habit that different words require different delivery. All right? Do you remember your first roller coaster ride? Here, the excitement. Now, was she smiling when she was <laughs> To be able to act it out is to remember your first one. You're asking us to remember the first. You need to see your first one. All right, so what comes after that? After that? Yeah. I'll never forget my first roller coaster ride. No, because we know it's a roller coaster ride, so you don't have to say it again. Not in the third sentence. See, remember Jerry Seinfeld? I will take an hour taking eight word sentences and edit it down to five. If we know what you're still talking about. Now, if this is ten minutes later, you've got to introduce where you are again. However, this is my was. Oh, my, my first was. But I just said my was. We'll um, start at the top and then you'll know. Because okay. it's very difficult to start in the middle. Okay. Do you remember your first roller coaster ride? The fear. Excitement. I remember mine because my big brother Tom tricked me into it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> He tricked me into going on the roller coaster. He 
uh, I wouldn't go on because my mom told us not to go. And what happened now is... Now, do you see, you're finding out more about her brother, just for this <laughs> Perhaps you relate to the brother. <laughs> So there was such a thing back then as phone booths, which some of you might remember. <laughs> some of you may not. I remember. He actually went into a phone booth, closed the door, was talking on the phone, smiling, laughing, and nodding. Came out to tell me that mom said, yes, Nancy, <laughs> we can go on the roller coaster. Just play with it and see. Perhaps you want to actually introduce mother earlier, token the brother, saying, now you're taking your sister out. You can do anything you like. She can have ice cream, but don't you dare take her to the brother first. <laughs> so again, this is how you play with it. And, and you, you get your mastermind, your tennis master club, and that's what you do. In fact, what I would recommend you all do, if you are serious, that you get a core group of three or four people who are around your level of experience or more. And if you have someone who's more experienced, I was very lucky when I joined Table, Table Car Toastmasters. It was in the IBM building, and we had, we had several Toastmasters who were very experienced. So they were very encouraging, but they gave us really good feedback. Because a Toastmaster club is great to get up and for camaraderie and confidence. And if you are lucky that people give you high caliber feedback, then you're ahead of the game. Yeah. And, and, that's, and I get together whenever you like, once a week, once every two weeks, once a month, and you take it in turns to present a story you're working on. Just a small amount of, of, of content, just one story. But you can see, especially if your friends were here, well, they, your friends aren't here, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> their friends aren't here, so you're going to have to, and I would challenge you all to do this, take your notes and teach somebody else what you think you've learned. <coughs> and so uh, I recommend you have a meeting, and these are the best ideas for Patricia Fred. Now, of course, you could invite me to your conference, but only if you get an audience this big. <laughs> no? Give me a year. Okay, good. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> Our next lucky participant can be, and of course, Michelle will know, any of the committee or Ruby will know, who would like to volunteer, who is on the committee or did a lot of work for this conference. Valerie. Now Valerie is my hero, of course, because Valerie got me here. Well, 
<laughs> Another story similar to the roller coaster. Story. Anyone else? A brother that was a year and a half. Okay. And another brother that was seven. All right. So you raised them. <laughs> or you at least felt like you did. All right, good. And her job. All right, one clap and we'll see what happens. I was the mother of three at age 12. I usually, and, and again, there's exceptions to every principal role, but how you present information to people is when, where, who, what happened. When, where, who, what happened. So just humor me and try it. And I might tell you, you know it's better the way you, you did it, but for this exercise at age 12, pause so they can put it into context of the time. At age 12, as a mother of three. Now pause there and let them think about that. Right? And then the next one. At age 12, I was the mother of three. <coughs> My mother found out she was a single mom. My stepfather left. Okay, good. Now you say, at age 12. Now, ah, uh, now, hearing what comes next, at age 12, I became. Can you imagine how terrifying it was to hear my mother say, Sweetheart, I need you to be a big girl. Because your daddy's left. And I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to work two jobs. And that means when you come home from school, you have to oh. You know, what did she say? Now, you're trying to think, did she really say that? Alfred Hitchcock said, a movie is like life with all the dull parts left. So what you are doing in a story is shrinking, and usually the best way to give us a lot of information that happened over weeks in a couple of sentences is to do it through dialogue that includes the backstory. As my partner in crime and coaching camps and world champions at Dad McCroy says, is what you are saying developing characters or moving the story forward? So what did she say? Now, can we see how and we all, if you know Valerie, you know she has a very vivacious personality. But can you see her delivery and the pausing is so appropriate for setting the scene? If she came out, oh, I'm going to give a motivational speech that's going to be inspiring, it would really go against the emotional connection she's trying to make. And she did make. So what did Mother say? My mother came and told me, your stepfather left us. And I because told me is 
and I think mother was actually treating you like an adult that you're going to have to become. And my mother said, and here's a technique, put your name in. Then you know and the audience knows who's speaking. She said, Valerie. And then she said, I know your brother's only, I know your sister's only, and your brother's only. So let her tell you. Because they are, she's, what she is doing through dialogue is giving you the whole backstory. All right? So wouldn't we encourage her to keep working on the story? Yeah. by watching people in the hot seat. Shout out what you think you've learned. Short techniques. Use dialogue. Use dialogue. Talk to one person. Talk to one person. Be specific. Be specific. Take out a word. Take out a word. Set the scene. Set the scene. Take your hand out of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Now I'm challenging you to take these ideas and go back to your Toastmaster Club and do your version, just pretend you're Patricia Frick. <laughs> <laughs> now again, from those of you who are on the committee and worked hard, do you have any short, specific questions you would like me to answer? Yes, sir. How do you convey a scientific concept in a story form? Do you do that? I try. <laughs> <laughs> well, come up here then and let's see. Right. Why don't you walk in and say, 
Would you like to hear the answer to global warming? Would you like to hear the answer to global warming? All right. Now, this is a scene of them going back to the office. So we are now going to step out of the scene and say, you're probably thinking, but I don't know the answer. You're probably thinking, I don't know the answer. Well, get out your pad and your pen. You're about to write it down. Well, get out your pad and pen. You're about to write it down. Right. Let him do it. And then you say, the answer is a simple... The answer is a simple equation. E equals mc squared. Speech. Now remember, over here is them in the office. So now you know, when you go back to work, you really can't say. <laughs> Would you like to know the secret of global warming? Would you like to know the secret to global warming? Get out a pad and pen. Get out a pen. You're pen. about to write it down. You're about to write it down. So you see, he can say, hey, is that helpful? Very much okay, so. Good. Good. Here are another couple of specific examples. Will you raise your hand if you live in the technical world? Perfect. Obviously, a lot of my clients in Silicon Valley come from technology and science. And I was coaching one one group, they had this new software, and they were trying to get financing. And I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> I said, well, understand if I have no idea what you're talking about, the venture capitalist won't either. And this is the question I always ask. And as a team, if you're in a technical environment, talking to people who are less technical, or presenting information to your senior management where it has to be a higher level of abstraction. I ask. How would you explain what you do to your grandmother who doesn't even understand what a fax machine is? And in this one case, what they actually said was, our software is like a night watchman. It lets, it keeps the bad guys out and lets the good guys in. Now I knew what they were talking about. So if you write it down, it is like. What is it like? Because if you're introducing a concept or technology or a new idea that we do not understand, Compare it to something we do know. Another example. My next door neighbor was a senior scientist with Genetic. And I invited him to give a presentation to my women's professional business group on the work he was doing developing an AIDS vaccine. And I said, Mike, remember, you know, we might be intelligent, well-educated women, but we don't spend time with scientists. And even if we do, we don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Tell them what is it like to be a scientist. And he came out with these words. Being a scientist is like doing a jigsaw puzzle in a snowstorm at night. <laughs> when you don't have all the pieces and you don't have the picture you're trying to create. Now can you understand the frustration and at least understand when a scientist starts research they have no idea what the end is going to be. Then, I mean and he was a fabulous speaker, he then went through his presentation, 
And he talked about DNA, and this was long before the O.J. Simpson trial and all the TV shows that we really know about DNA. But he said, imagine you have a store, and a thief comes in and grabs something off a rack and runs away, and you chase after him, and you grab his shirt, but he keeps running, but you've got his shirt. And the police can look at the perspiration in the collar, Yes, DNA, find out the video. Now, can you see how now, and that, as I say, that was at a time when we didn't know as much about DNA, but how simple that is to explain a complex issue. And then at the end, I helped him design this dramatic lens. He said, at the beginning of my presentation, you understood the frustration of being a scientist. So many people ask, why would you do it? Last story. Two steps forward on silence for dramatic effect. You don't do it more than twice in any presentation, or it looks like a technique. As Laurence Olivier said, the art is hiding the art. He <laughs> said, Miami, Florida, fourth day of a medical conference, 3.30 in the afternoon, would be in the same hot, room since 7.30 in the morning. The last speaker walked from the back of the room. A young woman we didn't recognize. <coughs> she went to the lectern and said, I am a 32-year-old wife and mother of two. I have AIDS. Please work fast. Standing ovation, first speech he'd ever delivered to a lay audience. Can you see the picture words in? Being a scientist is love. Doing a jigsaw puzzle in a snowstorm at night when you don't have all the pieces and you don't have the picture you're trying to create. And then the end tied in to the frustration of being a scientist. Why would you do it? It's all for the patients and for the health. Well, has this been valuable? Yeah. Yeah. Remember, now for those of you who were not here this morning, my friend Darren LaCroix, who was the 2011 International World Champion of Public Speaking, told me a great phrase. Some of you wrote it down. You liked it so much. Have you already received enough value that earns me the right to tell you how you might take it home? Sure. <laughs> Will you raise your hand if you've ever heard of, on his mail list, or her, Darren LaCroix. All right. Well, you know, Darren is a very dynamic, giving young man. And over the years, especially, and this is true with all the world champions, people are always asking for advice. And although they generously want to give advice, it gets to the point you couldn't make a living. So this was why Darren founded, with Ed and Craig and Mark Brown, World Champions Edge. This is an ongoing community where, for a very low cost, we give, you, we give you audio messages every week. We have a monthly coaching call where you answer your questions, we coach people, and you get all of this recorded on the EDGE site. We have literally hundreds and hundreds of housed messages and we have coaching camps. Darren and I are doing a speech coaching camp in June. 
and we have our yearly Lady of the Champs, which is a convention where we all deliver keynotes and three great days of the done. Now we have, as a thank you for being a Toastmaster, as long as we have the left, and I know 500, so we still have plenty left, uh, a, a gift for you from the Champs of Miss Frick, which is World Champions Edge CD, so you see a sample of the type of advice we send out every week. Now I'm going to encourage you all to go to worldchampionsedge.com. Worldchampionsedge.com. Because you can try out being a member experience for one dollar for one month. One dollar. And if you want to keep that, you find it about it's only twenty-nine dollars and ninety-five cents a month. Less than $30. So you might want to try that. And certainly we'll give you your CD. And then if you would want to take me home and actually give us a little money. We have here, these are two great investment, two Lady and the Chance conventions. So one of them is 20 presentations. The other is 19. Now, you put this CD or this thumb drive in your computer, they're all MP3s, you take them out, including the workbooks, all the handouts for all the sessions. This is probably the most high-impact information you can get for $99. Each of these we sell online for $197. Both of them for $97. If you are a fan of the, the champs, you'd love this. If you're a fan of me, you'd love this. If you never heard of the chaps, you'd love the men. <laughs> now, for those of you who are really, 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 really serious and think, I am ready to create my keynote, this was Darren LaCroix's idea. He said, Frick, you work with all these celebrities and all these corporate execs. I want you to sit down with me and come up with your process and create your keynote by next week. Now, if you've been thinking about it for three years, even if you created it in a month or two months, you're still ahead of the game. Now, this is eight CDs that you can listen to in your car, but then it is designed for you to sit down and listen to. We ask you questions, and there is a data disk, which means the 252-page workbook. Do not tell me, Miss Rip, I don't have the workbook. No, it is a data disk with lots of other information as well as your 252-page workbook that you fill in. Now, I've met several people that bought this from Darren. Will you raise your hand? All right, so we have people who already have it. And you said this was valuable, sir. You sat down. This is as if Darren and Fred are sitting here coaching you, except it's a lot more affordable. Now, if you want to come for Darren and Fred to coach you, go to World Champs Live. World Champs Live, and you see all the upcoming events. And the other champs do, do camps all over the country on storytelling and get paid to speak. And if you sign up for Lady of the Champs for next year, the end price close to the time is $800. This is $197, but at now. All right. End of commercial. Thank you very much. Now, <laughs> oh Lord and Master of the District, <laughs> either of my Lord and Masters from the District, give me one short, specific question, and that's how I'll close. What would you do if you froze on stage? <laughs> the question is. What would you do if you froze on stage? Early in my career, I was a men's hairstylist and I started speaking to Rotary Clubs to promote my business. And being a graduate of the Dale County class, they teach you to stack your ideas. And my Rotary Club speech, which I have not delivered since probably 1978, was a pig in the chicken, a parable of the fudge. So my father, Mr. Paul, Charlie, pessimistic barber, Laura, so and So I would remember my stack. 
then once in a while, you know, you forget what comes up. Now, first of all, have the security of knowing. Nobody knows what you intended to say. And I would recommend, especially at the beginning of your career, or if you have a brand new presentation or a different presentation, that you have the talking points on the lectern on a table, in case you want to look at it. But what I would do is I would stop and I would go over. Can, can. So I'd go up to some nice little rotarium and I would tweet it. Oh, it's so nice to have you here. I'd say, oh, you've got great hair. You should come into my salon. And while I am playing off the audience, thank you for being sit down. And while I'm playing off the audience, I'm thinking, pick the chicken, parrot the so However, the, the best advice is, of course, have an outline and, as Michael Caine said, rehearsal is the word, performance is the relaxation. It never ceases to amaze me that intelligent, well-educated, and ambitious individuals frequently overlook developing the number one skill that is guaranteed to position them ahead of the crowd. Namely, developing the ability to stand up and speak eloquently with confidence, or at very least, stagger to their feet and say anything at all. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps it is because, as Jack Lemon said, to speak in public takes the nerve of a bullfighter, the energy of a nightclub host, and the concentration of a Buddhist man. Congratulations for being a Toastmaster. Thank you. A uh, very quick announcement. We're going to have the international contest. It's going to be next door at the ABC Ballroom. And after the contest, please, please take all your gentlemen with you because we're going to prepare the room for dinner. And we want to start out on time so you can make your way out to the next room. Take a good break.